we'll get started. So our, well, thanks, our Sarah. host is Rob Weiss. Can Go I ahead. say though that I'm, I'm feeling a little guilty. If you folks don't mind, I just want to work through an issue really quickly before we start, because I need to work through my guilt. So I had to run an errand before this show, and that's why I'm running a few minutes okay. late. And um, that's not why I'm guilty. And I had time to give my dog his medication and feed my dog, but I didn't have time to walk him. Oh. So he's got his head on my lap, looking up at me like Come that. Daddy, and it's really hard not to feel guilty. So I'm wondering if you could help alleviate my guilt. We can try. We're okay. grateful you're here. <laughs> but I can't walk your dog for you. So That's okay. He'll, he, he has a doggy door. He'll be fine. Okay. Um, this is my guilt, not his problem. He could care less. Well, folks, uh, welcome. Um, this is, and there he is. Um, this is our weekly webinar. Sometimes we have 20 people, sometimes 40 people, never know who's going to show up. Um, and my goal in this, uh, in this um, hour is to do a couple of things. First of all, um, just to give you an opportunity to answer any questions that you have about sex, love, and relationship healing, intimacy disorders, sex addiction, porn addiction, all that good stuff. I'm here every single week, for, and I will cost you nothing. And believe me, if you're sitting in front of me, I'd be expensive. So here's the deal. I'm, I have a lot of years of my own recovery, and, um, and I've been uh, working in the field for a very long time, treatment centers, books, all of that stuff. And, um, and I just have strong feeling about people being able to get the help they need, whether they have insurance or not, whether they have a doctor or not, you know, whatever it is. And I know that this is very difficult stuff to ask about, talk about, and even forget that. Even if you get to somebody and are able to say, I'm worried about something about my sex life, Half the time, someone you go see doesn't know what you're talking about um, because they may not be educated around human sexuality. So I'm here to answer questions to support you guys. And um, you can also find we have podcasts called Sex, Love, and Addiction. I'm sure Tammy mentioned that. Um, if you go on Sex and Relationship Healing, you can find my books. You can find um, treatment center information, whatever it is you're looking for, videos, um, blogs, all of that stuff. We are a busy lot when we're not talking to you. So... Um, the goal, again, here is to answer questions about sex, love, and relationship addiction. You cannot see each other. You cannot hear each other. You are completely private in this space. And um, the only ones who can see your questions are, well, I think you could, everyone can see their questions, but they can't see who they are. And mm -hmm. Tammy will ask the questions. I'll answer them um, as best I can. But I want you to know this is not the only format that we're developing to support you guys. Um, we're looking at drop-in groups, which are starting really soon, I think, for partners. And also addicts drop-in groups. And in those environments, you'll be talking to each other and It'll be kind of like, you'll see me and Tammy, but you'll see everybody in the group. Um, and we will have facilitators there to monitor those groups and keep an eye out over those groups. Um, and then there'll be lectures where you can show up and ask questions and be live. So all of this is you know, taking time as it does when, when, um, when we don't have a, a family who's dedicated to tech, but, um, but we are getting going and, and we're really happy about it. So let me answer questions. By the way, you may see me also in the rooms uh, every Friday night at six o'clock. Exact same time, only I'm on intherooms.com. And that is also a wonderful website for the support of drug and alcohol addiction. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit more about the drop-in groups? Because that's a different concept um, than... Yeah, I, I will. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 so I, I spend more time online than most people my age do. And what I've noticed, and I'll give you a quick example. I'll give you a perfect example. And the, what I'm going to say, make an example of, is that people want to connect. That's what I believe. And whether you're sitting at home, you're sitting on your phone, you're sitting on the subway or on your device or whatever it is, there's always that nice feeling of, oh, there's actually another person out there who feels like I do, who sees something like I do, who's interested in something in the way that I am. That's called building community. And so um, just to say it, we, um, in case you find it, both on Twitter and on Facebook, we have put up this week um, a request for people to give us their songs that comfort them if they've been experiencing betrayal. And we're also asking for addicts, or I don't know if we're up to that, maybe next week we'll do that, but we're gonna be looking for, in other words, I wanna create Spotify playlists for recovery, for partners, for recovery. So anyway, we asked you for the songs that helped you heal. And I really heal a lot through music, so that's you know important to me. And um, you know, of course, this has been like, everyone has, everyone has a song, which is totally awesome. But what's, what the point I wanna make you about the drop-in groups is that I just put up a post saying what songs work for you in your recovery, you know, from whatever it is. And what I expected was a whole list of songs, you know, some of them, whatever, different generations, whatever. What I didn't expect was that the people would put the songs down and then they would start writing each other and say, I like that song too. And you know, that was a great song for me in recovery. And all of a sudden, all I did was put out this single monologue 
hey, what do you think out there about this? And not only are people coming back at me with, this is what I think, but they're talking to each other. And that is what we're trying to do, is create an environment where you can talk to each other. Um, you, not everyone has the ability or the time or in a situation to go to a 12-step group, although we fully recommend it. Um, not everyone's gonna make group therapy or even a therapist's office, but if we can create a space for you to experience what it's like to heal by looking at that wife in that box and saying, wow, she's attractive, she seems nice, how come she got betrayed? Or looking at that young man in the other box and saying, wow, he seems like a really nice guy. It looks like he's not really good to his kids. I can't believe he's a sex addict. You know, it's good for us to see people like us because we sort of think like we're the only one with a problem as much as we run into people and hear other people until we run into people who have the same problem as we do or the same excitement about a song. Um, there's something just really comforting and building about that. And that, that is what I want to grow. That's my belief. I'm pulling in Tammy, other friends who say, I think we believe it too. And even if it doesn't help you, there's a whole generation of young people who are used to, comfortable with, and familiar with creating community online. And they don't feel any different, as you well know, because you call it rude, some of us older folks, they don't really feel very different whether they're talking to someone on the phone or talking to a person, because they've made that connection. And so I'm gonna go with that and say a connection is a connection is a connection, and the opportunity to be in the presence of other people who, who are healing is a gift uh, in whatever space we can provide it. And don't you love when I do that? The light gets better, I'm gonna do that more. Um, I don't know how to make the light better, but whoo, that really worked. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and no, you know, in the whole big wide world, there are probably a couple of thousand experts in this, in this area of the work. And then when you really get down to the expert experts, the people who've written books and done research and developed treatment centers, there's maybe, you know, 15 or 20 of us. And I'm grateful to be one of those people. So I have a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge that I am glad to give you for free. Um, all I ask is that you drop by sex and relationship healing, you know, sign up. I don't care if you put in your fake email, <laughs> just sign up with an email so we can drop you a note, drop you a note and tell you when that drop group has started. Um, and that's, you know, we want to grow our community. That's really the goal. Okay. So questions. Let's do well, it. I just wanted to comment on that too. Even if it, it's not necessarily an either or, if you're going to a therapist, and you're going to 12 step meetings and lots of places, there are only a handful of 12 step meetings or one 12 step meeting, you know, for a, a sex addiction, uh, any kind of S meeting a week in an area. Well, you know, I was fortunate with my addiction that I could go to 10 meetings a week, you know, and that was what I needed at that time. So, so I think even if you go, it, this isn't, you go to your therapist or you go to your 12 step meetings or you come online, you do it all, you know, yeah, do, you, do what you can when you can. So, so we do have a question. Our first question is, what would be an approach to take when a couple has gone to a marriage to a marriage counselor for a husband with sex addiction and the husband continues to do very little to make his wife feel loved and appreciated? I'm assuming this is from the wife. Uh, it's not, it doesn't say. The sex addict husband, of course, defends himself and says he is doing so much because he attends a sex addiction meeting and is doing a workbook, but showing real love and concern is an ongoing problem. Okay, I call your husband an asshole. That's what I call him. Excuse my language. I'm feeling very upfront tonight. Uh, I went for a big long run before dinner. I'm all full of my energy. So um, your husband is not attending to the basics of his responsibility to you as a husband. Not only is he not show, really contrite or showing re remorse or regret, maybe he did for a little bit, but now he feels like that's enough. And now you need to get over that because I've really worked on this and you need to forgive me and we need to, and that's a bunch of crap. Okay, so I just want you to hear it from me. That's a bunch of crap, C-R-A-P. It's so much crap. <laughs> it smells so bad that I wrote a book about this because I've worked with so many men who don't understand the degree of harm and pain the woman experiences when she is betrayed. We think it's just about sex and hey, I just got that blowjob in Vegas. What's the big difference? You feel like we have wrecked our entire relationship and whatever, to whatever, whatever degree I've been doing whatever I've been doing, I have not been putting you first, our family first, my, our kids first, our relationship first, our community first. I've been putting my own needs first. And if your husband's a sex addict, he's probably been doing that for a while. So would it be so horrible if he put the needs of everyone else in front of his own for a little while? Probably not. And if he isn't, he doesn't understand, well, one of two things. He either doesn't understand the degree of harm he's caused you, or he just doesn't give a shit. And so to this end, I would say, I wrote a book about this. I, it's $12, go buy it. He it's already $12. did. 
Okay. Husband read out of the doghouse and still acts like this. Oh. So for everybody else, I wrote a book for husbands who just don't get it and don't understand the pain their spouse is in. And I have to say, so that worries me for you. And I really, really mean that. It's not, I'm a pretty good writer. And when I wrote that book, I was speaking directly to men about how their relationship can be severely, profoundly harmed for the long term by not properly healing the breaking of trust. And I have talked about it in that book about how it hurts your kids, how it hurts you. I don't think I could be more clear about the pain that I see spouses go through, male and female. So if, and, and I have worked with, I just want to say this to you, ma'am. I've had people read that book who had an affair 25 years ago, lost their marriage. Now they're on their you know, second marriage, new kids, whatever. It's 25 years later. And they have said to me, I read your book and thought, wow, maybe I could have saved that marriage if I understood what I needed to do. I wish I had known this then. I have had women read that book and say, and the book is called Out of the Doghouse. I've had women read that book and say, oh my God, I didn't realize how much trauma I had around being betrayed in this way because I was so busy taking care of kids and our lives. And I didn't get it until I read your book and it reminded me how much pain and struggle I went through when he was so cavalier about his behavior and I was devastated. So I say all this to say, not that I'm such a fabulous writer, but more that after 25 years of working with these guys, I understand what they miss, what they don't see. And I wrote a book to shove it in their face and say, listen, if you wanna love this spouse, this woman, this partner, if you wanna have this family, this relationship, you got to do some of this stuff. You've got to show, show some humility. You have to stop expecting that she's going to forgive you when you're ready to be forgiven. And you have to maybe get on your knees and pray a little bit in gratitude that you still have a spouse or have a family because, you know, I don't see any reason why this person wouldn't have left you. So all of that said, I have, um, I have only sadness. And I'll give you your money back for the book if you like, but I don't think that's the issue here. Either he didn't really read it, or he just doesn't care. There isn't a man on the planet, I think, who loves his wife and children on some level, who could really read that book and say, oh, okay, well, that doesn't matter to me because she's just going to have to get over it. I, I, just, I just don't think so. So either your spouse has not a lot of regard for your feelings, or he is so tired of hearing about it from you that he's just shut down that part of himself that's listening and he doesn't care what you say, he's not going to listen. Or you married somebody who doesn't have the capacity to show remorse and empathy. And I don't know which one it is, but I do know that you have the right to be angry and hurt and feel wounded and protective and not be ready to forgive until you see the change in behavior in your husband. You need to see the behavior, not hear it. Healing trust is not about candy or flowers or I'm really sorry. Healing trust is about showing up for you more than I ever did before and being willing to do whatever it takes to win your belief in me back. So I would, it's interesting. Let me say this to Tammy. Tammy and I were talking to a conference provider recently who was kind of like, oh, we kind of want you to come. We kind of don't. We kind of like you to come. We kind of don't. And we were really stressing about it. And I said to Tammy, you know what? Forget this. We're great. If they want me to come to this conference, they'll ask. We got other conferences to go to. And so I give you the same um, reframing of the image of the picture that you're in. You're in a picture frame. Let me reframe it for you. You're being victimized by a man who is unwilling to own his part from what you say. And um, you have a right to say, I am worth more than that. I, I'm willing to even forgive at some point some of the things that have happened, but you have to be willing to show me that I can regain your trust and that you are worthy of that trust. It's just pure and simple relationship stuff. You know, if your husband had done what he did to you, and I'm not talking about the sex. I don't know you, by the way, I've never met this person. I'm talking about lying, keeping secrets, cheating, you know, if he had done that at work, would he be going back to the same workplace once they found out? Would they discipline or challenge or would they just say, oh, listen, we, you're such a great, whatever it is you do at work, we don't care if you cheat and lie and steal, you're just always welcome here. So how is it that you as his spouse 
would tolerate something from him that his own workplace wouldn't put up with. So really the question is, what do you believe that you deserve for yourself? How is it that you can go about getting that? And if he's not available for that, where's the friends, the family, the support, the therapy, and the places where you can get the love you need, even if he's not willing or able to give it to you? And I just feel profoundly sorry for your situation because no person deserves to be cheated, betrayed, and then have it all come out and have that other person say, oh, well, I'm working on it. You should get over it because it's not that big a deal. That's just not fair. That's all I can say. I appreciate that. I think that's a very good answer. Okay, so this is somebody who's joined us before. And um, so she's wondering what healthy activities for hubby could be in his third circle, the healthy activities. It can't really be sports related because he has a very physical um, uh, job. And so she said he's walking like 30,000 steps a day. So okay. he, he just, uh, he doesn't have the capacity to do that. So what would be some things that could do there? There are kids. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, family games or whatever, but, and then there's another part of it. So, um, so I'll let you answer that one first. So. Well, let me go back to the source of the question, which is underneath the question, I think, which is, um, you are absolutely right to understand. See how the light fades in me? I'm so happy about this. I know. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll work it out. Um, you're absolutely right to understand that if your husband is putting down the porn or the masturbation or the acting out or that he, that that serves some function for him, making him feel better, soothing him, calming him, you know, stabilizing him, whatever it did. It wasn't about the sex, if you know a little bit about this work, you know it's about a lot of other things, then he will need to replace that with what I would call healthy pleasures. And so you're absolutely right on the mark with he's got to go out there and I have to support him in doing some things that are fun, just plain fun. And some of that fun, by the way, is going to a 12 step meeting. Some of that fun is journaling. Some of that fun is going to therapy because self discovery and self exploration can be fun and useful. Um, and connecting to other people who are healing is extremely useful. Um, but um, if he's not able to do physical activities, you know, it really depends on what he is interested in. If he's interested in tech, there's a whole world of things he can do to connect with people and do things. If he wants to do anything related to personal growth, maybe he wants to, you know, or career growth, maybe he wants to take a class. No, you know, maybe he wants to paint the house. Maybe he's been wanting to create that man cave for a while, you know? It, it fun, there are all kinds of ways for having fun. I mean, I would sing with a choir in church because I love singing. Um, I would join a theater group because I love being on the stage. You'd be surprised, right? But, um, <laughs> thanks, Tammy. But, um, but if he's not doing it, you know, or, or, you know, maybe chess, maybe, you know, I don't know. Uh, for me, I love cars. So I have a whole bunch of guys that I go driving in the hills with. I look at cars. I don't know these guys very well, but I like their cars. We hang out, we talk, transmissions and, you know, antifreeze. And that's really fun for me. And I'm not looking at anybody for sex and I'm not um, having to be responsible to anyone. I'm just out there having fun driving around talking to people about cars. And I joined a car club for the car that I have. And now I know people have the same car and it sounds really superficial and trite, but it has nothing to do with the cars or the car club. It has to do with the people. And so, you know, there are many, many ways. And, and this is the fun part that I want to bring to you. Recreation for adults. Yeah, sports are great, you know, but if that doesn't work for you, even sports are really about bringing people together in a structured activity where they can enjoy each other and, um, and celebrate each other. I mean, that's in some ways what's, and compete with each other and, and do what we do as humans. So, you know, there are many, many places he can go to get that. Um, and, but he does need to do it. And it's important, and I appreciate that you recognize that because I've had spouses say, if this is useful for other spouses, well, he or she was out every night doing you know what, and so now they need to be home every night taking care of me and the kids and the family. That's not really true. Um, this isn't punishment, this isn't purgatory. This is a time, if you wanna stay with us sex addicts, where we have to figure out how to live our lives without doing all that crazy stuff. And some of that means not being ball and chained to our relationship, but also going out. And, and, and I'm not, I mean that in a particular way, ball and chain because of our guilt, ball and chain because we're being punished. You know, we're not children um, and, I, and you're not my mom or my dad. Um, but if you are my partner and you've seen me struggling, you will want me to go out and start to build relationships that are healing for me, even though you'd rather have me home under your watchful eye, or as they say on, uh, what is it, Handmaid's Hill? Under his eye. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, you know, I was thinking I had a friend that built birdhouses, you know, that was his thing. And that doesn't require, you know, lots of energy, but that was, <laughs> some, yeah, yeah, well, I know it was his thing. So that's great, you know, so, so whatever, you know, whatever hobby, you know, works. I also am in a car club because I like my cars, you know, so, so, uh, you, you know, playing cards as a couple with another couple. I don't, oh, there's lots cards. of. You know, I love playing cards. Yeah. So, I mean, there's lots of ways, you know, and it doesn't have to be now I'm rigidly doing, you know, every, every day I'm doing, the, you know, I mean, it's like finding, exploring things and it doesn't have to be a lifelong commitment. Go try this. And I don't, don't want to build a birdhouse. Okay. Then go try that. So, you know, it's, it's just figuring it out, exploring you, you options. That? Yeah. That, Who is that? The dog. Best saying, dozer? Walk me. And now oh. I'm going to squeak you out. Well, that's funny. Okay, so the rest of the comment wait, wait, wait. is- I wanted to say one other thing about oh, that. Oh, go ahead. And I think it's important. And if you see me doing this, it's because my dog is at the other end. Um, yeah. Is there any dis- Okay, hold on a second. I'll just do this. So it, Hi, Dozer. It, it is really true. I am yeah. struggling with him. Okay, so um, see, this is not, this is not work. <laughs> um, one thought for you that I, I just had to say, because I know Tammy will agree, um, is if we can, help other people, that's one of the best ways we can spend our time. If we can volunteer for something that doesn't put us in relationship with people that we might want to, you know, come on to or have sex with, if we can help out in a church, in a school, you know, wherever, whenever we are often people, us addicts, no matter how big you think we think of ourselves, or actually we drain our self-esteem pretty quickly. And um, so to be able to go out and do things that make other people feel good, um, and that don't necessarily directly benefit us is one of the ways that um, we seek recovery. Um, and that also, gosh darn it, there's nothing like that. There is nothing like that smile on my face when I hear from one of you guys and say, I'll never meet you, I'll never know you, but boy, did you help me with that thing, you know? And so what, uh, we're, what Tammy and I are doing right here, by the way, we're not charging you. I don't know if you didn't notice that. <laughs> this is free. So this is us doing stuff that makes us feel good. I mean, we are supporting our work, but... We're also do, I know that every time I do this, I feel better about it because I learned something. I feel like I'm helping. Um, I feel like my time was well spent. And that is the best gift your husband could do is to give something to other people. Well, yeah, I mean, go to a nursing home and, you know, read to somebody or something. I mean, what, I mean, like, yeah, yeah. and she, she typed in that, you know, he, he struggles, you know, with connecting socially and feeling yes. like other people are, are, he's not as good as others. We all have so much shame when we start getting in recovery. I remember thinking, like you were talking about the poo poo before. It's like I remember thinking I was that's all I was, you know. And it took me a long time to start feeling like I had worth and value for who I was, not for what I did or whatever. But when I did something for somebody else, I felt like I was contributing. So, so one of the things she she was talking about too was um, any suggestions for helping. Um, him stay positive during the recovery. And I'm like, you know, you have, I mean, it's hard to stay positive. It's like, it's an emotional roller coaster. So it's not going to be all positive. It, you know, it's going to be like some days are better than others. And, you know, it, it, one of the biggest things for me, it, it was one day at a time and breaking it down. Sometimes I just had to get through the next five minutes, you know, but, and not do something that made me regret it. So, um, but it isn't, you know, like it's, it's difficult to come off of an addiction. Like we, I purposefully chose an addiction to escape feeling. So, so yeah, I had some down emotions. So I don't think that there's any like, oh, I'm going to, you know, it ain't happening. So, <laughs> but what and, do you think? And I just want to remind her all this, but see, it's getting darker. Dark. I know, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get some lighting. That's good. All right. That sounds um, like a So, but, um, what I want to say to you spouses was that, um, yeah, I always want to say this every week, just so you hear it. There's absolutely nothing that any spouse can do to make us go act out. Um, so even if he's down, if he's down, if he's struggling, if he seems sad, you know, I love that you want to support that. And I hope that he's able to work through that. Still not an excuse for going and seeing hookers or getting online and looking at porn or whatever it is that he does. Um, but yeah, this has been what's helped him internally feel okay about himself for a very long time. And so when he gives this up, he's going to need other ways to feel good about himself. And that's what the recreation part is for. Um, yeah, so we have more. I see lots of questions down there now. 
Uh, actually, there's the latest one. This person is more of a comment. I remember recommending public speaking to my ex as an adrenaline rush substitute, and he shut me down immediately. I learned that when someone is committed to their addiction, there's nothing else to do other than focus on my own self-care and detach with love. So, Yes, ma'am. Was that a question? That was, a, I said that was, it was in the questions, but it was a comment, so. Oh, okay. Well, folks, you are here, well, I am here to, uh, to give you absolutely uh, cost-free direction or feedback. I'm not your therapist, um, but I am a therapist, and I've been an, spent an awful lot of time in the sex relationship and addiction field. And I am more than glad to support addicts too. You guys are welcome to speak up. And um, if there are any love addicts in the room, that'd be great. If there are any porn addicts in the room who are saying, I don't know about this sex stuff. I'm really a porn addict. I love talking to you guys. We're going to have a porn addict drop-in group. I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah. Well, and you just did a, you did a new podcast recently. Two. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you talk about those a bit? One with Noah Church and one with... Gabe Deem. Of Reboot Nation. Yeah, Gabe Deem. I love these young men. I'm so impressed. You know, it's so funny. I have to say, it's not funny to you guys, but I'm now reaching out to young men in their mid-20s who are supporting people in their own community who are dealing with porn issues. And these are smart, reflective, um, caring men who are really into wanting to help people with something they've struggled with. And I have to say, I look at them and I remember being 25 years old and walking into my first 12-step meetings and thinking, wow, what the heck am I doing here? You know, And I wasn't even as far ahead as these guys are. They're really actively helping their communities at 25. So I'm really excited to, hear, to see these young guys um, coming together. And by the way, they come together online on websites with 3,000 guys. Oh my God, how do we stop masturbating to porn? Supporting each other. It's a beautiful thing. Question? So the question was, where do we find the podcast? And thank you for asking. Uh -huh. They're on, you, if you go to sexandrelationshiphealing.com, and Rob mentioned earlier, we'd love to have you um, kind yeah. of register with an email. It, it really does help. Um, but if you go there, there's a tab called podcast and you can find them. You can also, and that, that's through Stitcher, Android, or iTunes. I personally go listen to them. I just go into iTunes. It's sex addiction, uh, sex, love, oh. and addiction 101 is the podcast mm -hmm. series. Um, and Rob is the host and has a number of different um, topics, different guests, and uh, we've continued to add to that library. There's at least two dozen um, now. There's probably yeah. more than that, but they're on Pro Dependence, his new book. But they're um, the, you know two on, with these gentlemen about porn addiction. We've got Mother Hunger with Kelly McDaniel. Um, I, just a variety of of different topics with different leaders in the field. Uh, there's several from a betrayed partner specialist. So and also uh, female sex act. We have I think two yeah female, female sex act yeah, podcast, yeah which is really cool yeah. Yeah, they actually two, because uh, uh, Kelly McDaniel and Stacey Sprout both uh, All right. talked about that as well. So. so, yeah, we try to cover, I try to cover anything to do with sex and intimacy and addiction. So I talk with people about love addiction. I talk to them about, um, oh, the mother hunger one. Yeah, Kelly was great. Um, I can see your comment when it comes up. I, um, we've done some for gay men. We've done some on drugs and sex. We've done some on different, different races, Asian community, black community. Uh, and how these issues show up in those communities. I mean, it's just, yeah, and it's cool, I think, for me to have this, um, I don't know, like this bunch of information just sitting there that people can get in their car and just listen to. And what I would like, though, and I'm going to put this out there for you, Tab, Tammy, to tell these guys, there will come a time when I'm hoping that we'll have some recovering spouses want to do a podcast and some recovering sex addicts want to do a podcast with me so that we can sit and talk about your journey. And, you know, I don't need your name. I don't need to know where you live. I mean, they'll hear your voice. But, um, you know, at some point, I'd like to talk to people who have some real recovery about how we can help other people, what lessons you've learned, what's been helpful for you. Because I'm just the host. I'm just asking the questions. So I'm sure that will happen in the future. Well, and we've done some that were Q&A, um, where we took a number. I answer emails all the time uh, oh, yeah. from people asking, uh, you know, what about this? What about that? And we've done several of them that were just kind of like you know, taking generalized questions and answering those, you know, so that somebody might go, Hey, that's my situation as well. So those, I mean, overall, they've gotten really favorable feedback. And I see several people are 
um, uh, highly Thanks. recommend catching the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, there. And by the way, guys, um, Tammy, uh, just to introduce, is a really um, is is our director of relationship development, which just means that she is the hub person. Like I, I've never met anyone who is such a hub. You know, everybody <laughs> kind of come, you know, bounces off Tammy and bounces back out, or they come out from Tammy and come back anyway. So Tammy's our official hub person, which means when you write in to us on sex and relationship healing and you say, I don't know what to do with my husband or my wife is doing this, or, you know, I'm really struggling with addiction and I just have too much shame to talk about it. Tammy's the one who will take those emails and direct you to therapists, direct you to books, direct you to uh, activities that we're doing. Um, and, uh, and again, all of it is free. So, well, uh, and, and I, you know, I try to let people know you're not alone and there's hope, you know, that that's my big thing. Is, wait, wait, wait. Somebody said they're going to offer up their husband. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. They have to, yeah, they, they have that. to volunteer themselves. So, yes. yeah. so yeah. Um, this is and not it, intervention. We're yeah. not doing a TV show, but um, I actually want to hear from people who have, you know, good things to share about the process. Yeah. And, and because, yeah, so I think, a you know, hopefully at least a few years in recovery so that they've got. I don't, uh, I don't know how much you. I mean, maybe, I don't know where any of you are because I'm not talking to you, but the hopelessness that comes up around this is really profound. Um, you know, there were many, many times in my addiction when I didn't want to live. live. There are many clients I've had who have chosen not to live. Um, you think, oh, well, drug addiction, that kills a lot of people, alcohol, but having too much sex, you know, all you have to do is lose your family once or lose your career or lose your reputation and standing in your community. And if you're vulnerable enough, that will be enough. So I, I know that this disorder hurts people, ruins families, and, and also leads to people not wanting to be here anymore. And we'd prefer that you guys just not do any of that because you have us as support, um, or at least we're gonna be trying to be part, part of your support. So we got questions, let's answer them. Yeah, we do. So one of them is, um, I've been coming to SAA for about a year now and it's helped a great deal. Uh, give up masturbation, not being as impulsive as I once was, and not acting out. And I was wondering if that if that is healing from sex addiction. What does healing from sex addiction mean to you, Rob? Ah, I'm so glad you answered that. I mean, ask that. I actually talked about this on In the Rooms this week. Um, I'll tell you exactly what it means. After 25 years of doing this work, um, and and then 10 years before that of being in my own recovery, I'm very clear about what recovery is for me. Recovery to me means being known that there's no secret that I have that someone doesn't know about or that I wouldn't be willing to tell someone there. You know, I don't necessarily want you to see what I had for lunch or see me in the shower. But if you saw me taking a shower, or eating lunch, you would be surprised. I want to be the person who has integrity. Integrity is what recovery is about. That you as my wife, you as my husband, you as my friend, you may not know everything about me, but there's nothing that I would want to hide from you because I don't have anything to hide. And that really is a good balance. You know, when I think about sexual recovery and I think about some people think that it should look like this. You know, I only have sex this way. And some people think it should look like that. I only have sex that way. And I don't think it's necessarily about that. I think it's about how can I live in, in integrity and feel good about myself and feel good about the way I'm treating the people in my life um, and not hurting them, not letting them down, not keeping secrets, not hiding, not living a double life. You know, when you start to unravel all of that craziness, I mean, that's what sex addiction is. And I don't ever want to live in a box of my own making anymore. You know, I grew up like that. So, um, you know, in the most obvious way for the first few years, especially, uh, recovery is just about time. It's about getting six months or a year or a year and a half and knowing, trying to, you know, a lot of us has been being sexual in one way or another to make ourselves feel better since we were 12. And so try being 30 and all of a sudden you got to figure out who you are if you're not flirting you're not hitting on people you're not masturbating you're not who am i why would anyone even want to talk to me if i'm not hitting on them flirting on you know there are so many ways that we shape who we are around the addiction um and when the addiction disappears or we try to eliminate it it doesn't just leave a gap in time or activities it leaves a gap in who we think of ourselves as being and um and so the process is long um and it never really ends, you know, it does go on. I'll never be the person that I would have been if I had a healthy family. Most of my clients never will be the same person they would have been, but, but um, hey, who could talk to you about masturbation had I not had the child that I had? So, you know, there are always advantages. There's lemons to lemonade. Um, we have more questions. 
Well, I want to just tag on to what you were saying too. And, you know, I think really you're working with a sponsor, working with your therapist and finding out what it means for you, because like you said, you know, what it means for different people, you know, it's what behavior isn't going to be problematic for you. And that's going to be different from person to person. Mm -hmm. Unlike alcohol, where you go, you know, the plug in the jug and all that, you know, it's like, it's very easy to define that, you know, it's, it's abstinence, but not with sex. You have to, you know, it's about having healthy relationships and what's going to work and, and facilitate that for each person. So, you know, working in, in a trusted community, good therapists, good sponsors to discern what is going to work for you and the timing. Website. I'm sorry. Website. I still website. Can... Oh yeah. Us. Yeah. Well, yeah. Our, yeah. Yes. But that would be community. That would be safe yes. community too. But we won't be able to offer like for you this, you know, a, a detailed thing where somebody who's gone for through a fourth or fifth step could go, Hey, this is what's going to be problematic for you. So that's where I was going with that. So, okay. What if I'm a sex addict, but my spouse has a very low libido and erectile dysfunction? So I'm not sure if this is a female sex addict or gay couple. I'm not sure about that, but you know, so what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, and thank you, Victoria. I appreciate that. Um, wow, that's such a huge question because um, I, I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, and the reason I don't is because there's so many questions within that question, meaning why does he have an erectile dysfunction? What's going on with him? Has he had trauma? You know, what does that come from? Is it physical? Is it emotional? Does he want to deal with it? Does he not? I mean, there's all of that. Um, and that's just his part. And then there's yours. And I don't know, again, if you're a guy or a gal, but either way, here's the, do it. Here's the message to you. You know, your spouse, if you really love them and you're really committed to them and you really want to be in this relationship, then they deserve, I think, you're going to them and saying, hey, I'm not happy with our sex life and I am not willing to be celibate and I'm not willing to just have a sex life with someone who doesn't get erections if they can do something about it. So let's get some help. Um, I don't think that a spouse who is disappointing you sexually or letting you down sexually or even emotionally, you know, not showing up or just absent or distant or irritable or, you know, we, it's not, it's not a healthy or I don't think, I don't think it's a healthy response to say, well, you're down and I'm not getting my needs met, so I'll just go have sex with other people. Um, there are many other ways to handle relationship issues. You know, If your man is not being sexual, you could not be sexual for a while and work on it with him. You could figure out, you know, and if you wanted to have a separate sex life from him, and people do, you need to go through him. You, ha you, know, you have a bond with him, you have a commitment to him. People have open marriages. It's not my job to say, I'm, I do sex addiction. It doesn't mean I tell you how to live your life. You know, if he's absolutely not interested in sex and you guys want to stay married and he says, go do whatever and you agree to it and stick to your rules, I don't care. Neither should he. But lying to him, keeping secrets from him, making his problem an excuse for you to go do what you want to do, that's not okay. And again, it's back to that integrity thing for me. Now, your husband or boyfriend or whatever he is might say, I am absolutely not okay with your sleeping with other people, but I'm not going to work on this either. And that means you have to look at, do I want to be in this relationship? Is the loss of our sexuality or sexual health, is that a make, make or break deal for me? I, I don't know. But I do know that you want to walk with your head up high. You want to be able to say, I don't have any secrets from him. And if you do choose to leave, and I, I say this to people all the time, you know, I often have clients who say, well, I, I, I think I really need to leave my partner because I'm in love with someone else or because I'm ha we're not having good sex. Or, And my question is always, do you feel that you've given that partnership a fair chance? And oftentimes people say, oh, yes, I absolutely have. And then I'll say, you mean you've talked to her or him about the fact that you're going out with someone else now because you are so unhappy? Oh, well, no, I don't want to tell them that. I don't want to upset them. So it's really the integrity with this is where I'm at with our relationship that I can come home every night and feel good about myself, whatever's going on. And then they can feel good about themselves and we can feel good about each other. There are many ways to love, but lying and cheating and keeping secrets and living a double life is not love. It's deceit. It's a double life. It's not what anybody would want to have and I wouldn't wish it on you. 
Okay, how about this one? The situation is this is someone who is in a longer term affair with a married person and has children, teenage children. And how do you, um, and it's, it, the affair is over, what kind of support is there for, it's kind of the victims of this whole double life? Well, do the kids know? Do we know? Yes. Well, that's a tough one. Um, I don't, I'm not rolling my eyes anyway. It's just if you can avoid your kids finding out about your sex life, that's really helpful. Um, no teenager, certainly, even an adult child, they may want to know you've had some problems in your marriage, that you and mom and dad are fighting, that there's been some unhappiness. But, you know, if you can avoid it, please try to tell them as little as possible about the sexual behavior. This um, is the affair partner's children know about the relationship. Okay. Now I'm really confused. So what kind of support is, like, so it, it's oh, caused a the mess. Affair. And now yeah. these kids, you have a relationship with these kids. No, I, th I think if I've got it correct, this person was the affair partner and has children. And then there was somehow a relationship. So they knew about this affair. I think it was more of a, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Well, okay. So let's if, talk about the trauma that it, uh, these relationships cause. How's that? We'll make it more um, generic. Well, let me just say this. Um, if I am in an affair and I have been hurting my partner by being in an affair and um, then I am fully responsible for that affair, but I'm not responsible to continue to try to help someone else's kids while I'm trying to stay in my marriage. I, I don't know if that's what's being said, but you're going to have to completely dis dissociate it and no longer be have contact with that person if you want your marriage to work. And so those kids are going to be out of your life and the problem that you've created with them um, unfortunately is something that their mother or parents are going to have to deal with. And, you know, what a great lesson for you that you don't want to, you might get attached to other people's kids or they might get attached to you, or they might find out something that's happened that you had a part of, you know, let me say something about that. Um, when I talk about what recovery means to me today, I'll tell you what it meant to me in the beginning. Um, one of the most important things to me in my earliest, um, sex plans and, and defining recovery for me is that I didn't want to hurt anyone anymore. Um, when I was active in my addiction, I didn't care if I had sex with someone who was married. I didn't care if I had sex with someone who had kids. I didn't care if I had, I didn't care about them at all. And I think there, I probably caused some harm. I know I caused some harm and I had to clean that up. So, you know, I remember one of my first plans was above all else, cause no harm. And so, you know, kind of like physicians say, above all else, cause no harm. So, you know, if you really have caused another family harm with your behavior, you may not be able to fix it, but what an incredible lesson for you to know, I never want to feel this way. I never want to feel the bad guy who's hurt other people. I just don't want to feel that way. And especially in a situation where I can't make it better like this one. Um, so um, I think, and Tammy, you can probably back me up on this. There's many times in 12 steps when we want to fix something that we can't fix, we want to make an amends that we can't make. We want to, you know, and, and maybe you might have a word on how to have some peace with that, even though there's, is something about how you live your life today, I think. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And, you know, there are some amends you can't fix. And, and I've been emailing with this person and I'm going to, you know, give some therapist suggestions because I think some higher level support is, is needed. So I, I will do that more tomorrow too. So okay. uh, somebody wrote, I bought your book. I don't know which one I'm assuming. I'm assuming pro dependence, but we'll see. Um, and, I wrote you, 10. <laughs> yeah, and you hit the nail on the head for me. Thank you for validating, validating okay. how I feel. So that was nice. So, yeah. um, so this one is, I want to support my wife. So this is the male addict. I want to support my wife and show remorse without triggering her anger and exasperation, as well as my own defensiveness. What are small ways to gently earn trust? Um, well, there's a saying, if you want to be trustworthy, do trustworthy things, you know? So the simplest way, the easiest way to regain trust is to keep your word, show up on time, bring the groceries home when you said you would. Don't ask her to invite you to watch TV twice. Go 
and join her the first time. In other words, don't, anything that you've done, anything, well, I'll use myself as an example. I, I can certainly be narcissistic in my relationship and there are times when I think I deserve to not have to clean up the dishes or I feel like, you know, I've done enough today or this is a time when you want to go the extra mile. And even if she says, well, you're just really trying to push up to me, you are. <laughs> it's nothing, it's nothing, nothing to hide. And you know what? A lot of times I find that I hear from husbands that, you know, I think a lot of the, they'll say stuff like, I think a lot of the things that I've been doing to help her trust me more and to gain forgiveness are probably things that I should have been doing all along. Like being more forgiving, being more loving, being more available, being more helpful. Um, cause if you're an active sex addict or love addict, you're not present for your relationship and therefore your partner's needs, it's just so easy to dismiss them. Oh, well, I took out the garbage day, so she doesn't need that. Well, maybe she does. And right now during the healing process, it's not the time to say, I took out the garbage. She can do that. It's the time to say, I took out the garbage and I'll help her with that. <laughs> um, because you're trying to clean up your mess and you want to show that you love this person. So make their life easier in any way that you can. And I'm going to say, take out the garbage and don't go and don't say, I took out the garbage. Like, just do it. Like, just see how many things okay, you can okay, Wait, 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 wait. I got to tell you that that is a, that's not about addiction. That's a man thing. Well, <laughs> all men take okay, out. Okay, it's a man thing, but yeah. All men take out the garbage and say, honey, I took out the garbage, you know, and I, I cleaned up the kitchen, you know, like it's such a miracle that we did that, but we want all that validate. I think that might just be us, but I could be wrong. I, it, it possibly I still tell my husband thank you for unloading the dishwasher only I am really grateful but I I want to encourage great behavior he's a great guy don't worry buddy but it's one of those things where Your husband is a great he never guy. has to say thank you for unloading the dishwasher to me and I don't care I'm not looking for it but I want to reinforce positive behavior so but I'm just saying to you like just just do stuff and don't go hey I'm I'm doing good yeah, yeah. Hopefully that helps though. But yeah, I think it's a lot of those things. And, you know, I mean, maybe even just say, you know, what, what can I do for you today? You know, is there something that would be helpful for you today? You know, I mean it sincerely look in her eyes. I mean, to me, that's um, what I have to, my dog is about to eat a squeaky toy and swallow okay. it. So okay. I'm going to go get him a cookie and I'll be right back. So maybe okay. we can get the next question. I will work on that. So. Hey, oh, hey, pro-dependency. Hey. Yes. Yeah. So pro-dependency, um, uh, it actually, so somebody wrote that it was pro dependence, the moving beyond codependency. And that book did just um, release in the middle of September. It was, it's charting high on Amazon and different categories, of course, substance abuse, whatever. So, um, yes, you can find somebody if they haven't read it yet, hand it to them, hand it to your therapist. There are a few therapists who are actively engaging with pro dependence. And we're going to be, it's on the list because we're going like, okay, so there'll be a workbook coming out. There'll be some other materials. So keep watching for that. We'll have a pro-dependence drop-in group. So you will be able to do a drop-in group specifically for pro-dependence probably in the next few weeks. I, yeah. So we're, we're getting there with that. So, okay. And, and, for, and for those of you who are asking just very briefly, um, I have spent 25 years, you know, working in the field of addiction and I've never felt comfortable with the codependency model. It, it always felt too blaming to me and putting responsibility where it didn't belong. And so codependence is a reframing of that issue for me. Um, it's been about 35 years since we've really had a new model for partners of addicts and I uh, created one and one I think that's much more loving and validating and yet still really supports you guys. So um, that's what that's about, just to say it. Hey, we got questions in there. We don't have much time. Let's get to them. Okay. So one of them is a kind of a follow-up. Um, she thank for the answer. It's difficult being in a marriage with a husband who continues to show he doesn't care. Um, he, he feels like he's doing so much because he's going to, to one SAA meeting a week. Um, uh, he has opportunity to travel internationally and she expressed traveling together to make memories and he made me feel unwelcome and not wanted to travel with him. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's not so, a good marriage. Not as I, yeah. I mean, and I don't mean to say it can't be a good marriage. But right. Every when every time you type, it sounds bad. That's not a happy marriage. No. And, and every, or, or somebody. Well, I'm thinking is too. 
uh, you know, I, I, I'm like big deal. I, like grateful he's going to one meeting a week, but I was like, how much time did he spend um, thinking about acting out, planning, acting out, acting out, or thinking about act, having acted out a week and like going for one hour a week kind of in, if it's like pales in comparison. So, so yeah, I think that's one of those, um, you know, you need to look like Rob said carefully at what do you want from a relationship and what, you know, can you ultimately expect from, you know, yeah, we always I, hope that people can come together, but you know, uh, so my husband and I are five and a half weeks out of disclosure day. He's been staying with family since then. I don't want to see him yet, but we talk every night and he's trying. I haven't had sex with my husband more than a handful of times in the past few years, despite my begging him for sex so many times. So she's starved for touch and I feel like I'm going to burn down. Um, she's young. I can't imagine being able to get past the fact that what he's done with a hundred other women, I married him because I love him. I really don't want to sleep with other men, but she's, you know, she's devastated. Okay. So. I have some suggestions actually. Um, so one of the things that we do with people who are going through trauma, let's say, and they're not ready to be sexual or they don't feel comfortable is massage. And you can find a massage therapist who is not attractive to you, who's, you know, if you're not into women, who's a woman or an older woman, something you're, and, and make sure you get touched. And, and if they're good, you know, you could say to them, I'm, I'm not being sexual right now. I'm not getting a lot of touch. And not that you want them to be sexual with, but you know, that, that they know that you want to be touched. And, you know, massage is the business of touch. So, and if you go to a professional and, you know, you're not attracted to them and everything's above board and then you should be able to go there and feel like, okay, I am, you know, it's not the same as being held by the person I love. No way. But I did get a massage chain. Then I took a hot bath and maybe I satisfied, satisfied myself sexually. I, I spent time with me, you know, in some way. And it won't replace what you're looking for in your partner, but it, it, it might help you tolerate the time until you're ready to reconnect. And... I would not push your feelings about him aside and say, well, compared to sitting with a hundred women, what could my love mean? I think your, your love might mean a great deal. And um, if he is willing to put himself on the block and work on this for your relationship, you might have a better relationship than most of us ever do because you're young enough. You know, a lot of us don't face these issues as couples until we're in our thirties or forties or fifties. You might be young enough to have an amazing relationship. I do also want to say this on the other side, you know, if you're married to someone who's not working on it, who doesn't give a shit, who just expects you to put up with it, you know, it doesn't sound like who you're with if you went through disclosure, but, um, you know, you don't have to stay. No one's making you stay, but, but you picked him for a reason. And, and I believe what you're thinking, which is, I'm guessing that everything about him can't be wrong. Everything about my picking him couldn't be wrong. And, you know, maybe he's just really, really broken. And, you know, we deserve love too. So I doubt he tried to hurt you, wanted to hurt you, meant to hurt you. He did deeply. I could understand wanting to say, well, he had all the sex and I didn't. Now it's my turn, you know, and who would blame you? But it's all about, as Tammy said, you know, how are you going to feel about yourself? What, what makes you feel good about you? Um, and if you've been patient this long, you know, now is going to be the time when you get to speak up and really ask for what you want. And then you're going to see. In fact, let me just say this. In the next six months, that may tell you whether he's really the man for you to be with or not. Now that you've gotten through disclosure, now will be the time to begin to see how do you work through things now that there's an even playing field. Now that there's no more secrets on the table, how do you regard each other? Um, what does he do that makes you feel loved? What does he do that makes you feel afraid? You're in new territory as a couple now. And I would, and, and you're also grieving and in pain. And I can imagine that that might be a time that you might want to run and find someone to make you feel better. And I would too. Um, but hang out just a little bit. I think that there's some hope here that you got someone in this relationship with you who's really willing to put it on the line and tell you everything. You know, that just doesn't happen every day. I've seen a lot of guys walk away from relationships like this and say, screw you. I'm not telling you crap. And he didn't do that. So maybe he is the guy you thought he was. Well, and I don't see, I don't, you don't mention it, you could be, but I don't see that you are getting support for you from, because this is devastating and traumatic and painful and everything else. And, and you deserve somebody professional who's qualified to support you in working through this. And I do hope you'll join the drop-in groups when we get them started. And I mentioned Kristen Snowden is doing a webinar this Wednesday yeah. at 1230. About healthy sex. 
uh, and hers, yes, hers is about relationships and all of it. So yes, so 1230 Wednesday afternoon Pacific time. So it's on our website, but you can always email me too. But um, please join us for that as well. But uh, yeah. You know, yeah. I want to say one, one more thing here, Tammy, because I know this person is really struggling and she said, you know, I'd really like to have sex. And I heard that and I want to validate that, that let me just say one more thing. I know we need to go, but if someone you love truly is not going to be able to meet your needs over time and you've discussed that and you, you know, this is okay for you to say this might not work for me. It really is okay. But um, he's not going to come roaring back into your arms having sex five days a week with you. You know, if he avoided sex with you and he ran to other people so often, so long, and then put your sexual needs down and said, you know, well, uh, not tonight. That's a deeply, in, deeply ingrained pattern in your relationship. And that's going to require some, some therapy. You're going to have to get past not only the betrayal, but also how can we maybe go see a sex therapist and begin to restart our sex life or start our sex life. And I'll tell you how it starts. It starts by holding hands. Um, I'm going to, are we at time for one more? Um, I think, uh, let's see. No, there's, yeah. I'm going to go eat dinner. Okay. I think we're, I think we're pretty caught up. So I think we're good. So thank I'll you all you for joining us. We'll, yeah. Again, Wednesday at 1230 with Kristen Snowden. 1230 and Pacific 1230 time. Pacific time with Kristen Snowden. I always give it Pacific time. All and right. then we'll be back here next Monday. And if you have questions or need to reach us, drop down a note at, exactly. uh, on the TV contact. At seekingintegrity.org or through the, ideally go through the sex and relationship sure, healing. Com. Yeah. And, and the podcasts are there and there's so many podcasts. When you guys are talking, I go, Oh, they just went and listened to that podcast. I think that, that would help. Bye too. guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Night.